asked me to do that? Who expected me to do that? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> that was something that I invented. This idea that, like, I had to be as good as him. There's a strong disdain or distaste towards Rudius, and there's a strong rejection towards the character. What are your thought process on that? How have you handled that? At first, it annoyed me. I never, yeah, I never considered that. Wow, he's my son. <laughs> he's my boy. He's my baby. Can I, like, come dissect the finale with you? Uh, try that one more time. Let's see if we, they can hear you. Okay, can can everybody hear me? Can anybody hear me? There you go. Now you have chat saying hi. Hello. Oh, hi guys. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, nobody has ever been this excited to see me before. This is nice. No, <laughs> it's really flattering. <laughs> Trust me when I say, like, my entire community is like thrilled. Like, you have thousands oh. of fans out there just thrilled to hear you, talk to you, get to even know you a little bit. You guys, yeah, hi guys. <laughs> Thank you for being here. You see, there, there's the we love yous already coming through. Oh, I love you too. <laughs> do you want to do a quick little introduction? I'm sure that they already know you, but like all the roles that you've done and whatnot, so they have a little bit more of an oh, idea. Oh, gosh, sure. Um, uh, hi, I, I'm Maddie Morris. Um, in addition to uh, being the English voice of Rudius, I do most of the script adaptation for the uh, Mushoku anime. I was the voice of Zazie the Beast in Trigun Stampede. I was uh, Minase Nagisa in Girlfriend Girlfriend. What else am I, what else do I do? Ed, do you know, what, are, what do I do? <laughs> Ed, do you know what I, <laughs> like, I played Miko in yeah, Kaguya-san Love you know. is War. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I do, uh, I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of script adaptation. I'm very, very passionate about it. And I am a huge, uh, a huge fan of the Mushoku uh, light novel series. And honestly, that's amazing. Um, you know, when we were having our, our little conversations beforehand, I was like, huh, I wonder how, what other roles you've done. And seeing that you did like Ikomino and like all the roles that you've listed, I was, I was a little taken back because I'm like script that like, you know, analyzing the script, transcribing the script, doing all, like everything that you do, along with voicing all these wild, all these different characters. I guess for you, my first question would be, who's your favorite character that you've voiced so far and why? Oh, gosh. Um, so I always say that this is like picking your favorite children. And I know that you're not supposed to do that, but it's Rudeus. It's always <laughs> Rudeus. <laughs> there, was a, there was a time where he would have been neck and neck with maybe one or two other characters, but it's Rudy forever now. It's my boy. <laughs> it's your boy. So how far ahead do you read? Um, you know, go ahead. Um, so it roughly they are adapting one book into four episodes. Uh, so that will that will mean the end of season two here will go through book 12. Mm -hmm. And when we wrapped the first core of season two, I went ahead and read books 10, 11, 12, whenever that was last summer. And now that we're back in it, I am rereading it just like a few chapters ahead of um, where the anime is before I do the script or, or go into record. Sure. And, and uh, I did just, oh, I just saw somebody in the chat said, don't spoil. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I start to, if I start to leak spoilers, yell it, please yell at me. Cause I, <laughs> I have spoiled myself a lot for things that happen late series. And I don't want to ruin that for anybody in this chat. Uh, and, and it's kind of funny because chat has a no spoiler policy. I'm taking it like one episode at a time. And we like, we read some chapters like, you know, here and there uh, on here. Which is surprising because, like, my, my main regard has always been to go ahead and, like, analyze where the characters are at that moment in time mm -hmm. and see how that can change them in the future, right? Um, so I guess my first question going into this is what got you into voice acting? I always wanted to do theater. I always mm. wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a stage manager. I wanted to be a sound designer. A techie. I, I want. Yeah, I was. I was a techie first, and that's that was my first love. I got a degree in theater. My my undergraduate degree is in acting. Actually, it's in sorry, it's in art and performance with a focus on the performing arts. Man, <laughs> whatever. Because uh, my college didn't have a real theater program. Um, Fair. Uh, but I, I majored in acting and started auditioning for, uh, I live in Dallas, Texas, and there's a huge, um, very robust, uh, theater, live theater community in Dallas. Um, 
and started working there for I don't know I don't know how how big like anime dub fans your chat is but the first play I ever did professionally mm -hmm. um starred Chuck Huber and Aaron Roberts and Austin Tyndall um who are all fairly <laughs> prolific yeah. in this industry and just being around uh the people in in live theater that I got to be around and, and the people that I got to learn from my interests started to veer in that direction and one day i like it was i think it was the last open call mm -hmm. audition that funimation ever had and i saw that there was a there used to be like a weekly newsletter of all of the auditions in the entire dallas fort worth metroplex um and i scrolled down one day and saw that funimation was having an open call audition and i was like i grew up watching anime like i'm an actor like i bet i can go do this right <laughs> and i auditioned in what october i started booking that December and I never stopped. Wow. Um, so so it was kind of an, it was kind of an accident. <laughs> yeah. But that's amazing. And that's great to hear that you've been able to go ahead and like thrive, even with your, you know, performance and arts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, the fact, the fact that I've been able to make a, a living in the arts is incredible. And like, I do still get like, I see some of my friends and like people I grew up with who have what I would consider quote unquote real jobs mm -hmm. uh, and and houses and things. Um, and uh, it makes me a little bit insecure. And then I have to remember like, I you wanted this, Maddie. <laughs> you asked for this. This is the life you pursued. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's I feel very, very fortunate. And, and, and I guess I'll throw this even further down the line if you're okay with it, which is... Oh, please. Like, first off, amazing, right? And I, and I will always be, like, a huge advocate for the arts, right? Because I think that, number one, it allows people to go ahead and, like, build their emotional intelligence and be able to go ahead and use, yes. a, lot of, use a lot of the skills that you learn, like, in theater classes, um, drama, music, art, whatever that may be, um, to grow as an individual. But my mm -hmm. question for you is, okay, so if that's how you got into voice acting, then what led you to become an actor? Like, what was your motivating spark for that? Ooh, so when I was a kid, I was always very, very shy, super self-conscious. I hated meeting new people. Um, you know, I didn't, I, I was the kid who didn't want to order food at restaurants. You know, like I was too shy to talk to the servers and everything. Sure. Um and I felt like I had my whole life, like be, both being shy and um, being, uh, I think I think I attribute a lot of this to being socialized as a as a girl, as a little girl, right. um, that I often made myself small and tried not to take up space, um, both physically and and emotionally. Really, um, I didn't want to need things i was very much you know don't don't look at me um and i think eventually i realized that all of that time i spent being small uh i i needed to get something out um right. and doing it through the stage seemed like the safest place to do it and it's become that's become the place where i'm the most comfortable being my most authentic self sure and i've i've had this conversation with other actor friends of mine who uh, one actor in, in particular that I was um, that I was talking to, he sees a, a role as a mask that right. he gets to put on and be himself through that character because it's not it's not me, it's the character doing these things. Right. <laughs> Whereas in my in my brain, it's the character drops the Maddie Morris in real life mask. Sure. And. I get to I get to you know be raw and feel whatever the things I am feeling without feeling like I need to filter it and, and that's it's very freeing and very it's very comforting to have that that outlet right and I love the fact that you know first off you bring this up and second off you 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 state that like you were this shy girl that like a lot of <laughs> a lot of individuals were like taught don't take up space and absolutely true and I still hear this today even with a lot of my clients right where it's still spreading today and you still have those values of be quiet, don't take up too much space, let the adults speak, you know, so on and so forth, which is mm -hmm. very limiting uh, in that regard. 
but for yourself to have grown and blossomed into the wonderful actor and actress that you are <laughs> and given voice to so many characters that are demanding on stage or on screen and I feel as though maybe, I don't know if you know this, but maybe you have become a big advocate for a lot of people to also speak up and also take space. I hope so. Like, that's... Because that's the other thing, too, is I don't want to place any, like, um, any blame for that. Like, I don't want to assign responsibility to that, to any event or any person. Right. I don't feel like... I was ever overtly encouraged to be small. Mm -hmm. um, like my parents were fantastic. Um, my upbringing was great. I love my family, but somehow I got this idea into my head, and it was it was fairly damaging for me as a as a kid. And right. like these are things that I'm like still like now as an adult trying to figure out. Like, oh, that's why I did life that way for so long. <laughs> Um, and yeah, like knowing that there was nothing, like, I can't pinpoint anything in my life that told me, you know, be small, don't need things, right. but I, I got that into my head anyway. And so if I can, if I can reassure anybody, <laughs> uh -huh. um, that they deserve to take up space and they deserve to be authentic and feel the things that they're feeling in that moment, then, then that is something I want to encourage. And that's powerful. That's amazing. Through that, though, you also brought up something very interesting that we've been talking about since, I think, the very beginning of Mochiko Tensei, which is mask, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the roles that we all play. Um, I guess for you, right, what mask do, would you say that you wear on the regular? Uh, or what mask do you feel like you incorporate into your life? Because, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll highlight it with this, right? Masking is normal, chat. I know we've gone over this. Uh, we all wear different masks. We all play different roles. Father, son, uh, therapist, whatever your career mm -hmm. may be. We all have these different roles that we put on and different masks that we attune with them. So what about yourself? Um, and also just to add to that, um, I think it's interesting that you phrased it that way too, because I think of... It, with masks, I think of attitude with mm. with playing roles like, you know, son, brother, husband, father, sister, daughter, whatever. That I consider a hat more like. But that's also like code switching. Like you don't talk to your mom the same way you talk to your, you know, uh, your best friend from school, whatever. Um, but it's interesting to to conflate all of those under the same under the same word, under that same mask label. That's really that's interesting to think about. <laughs> Uh, I think I go out of my way to be polite and courteous, sometimes to sometimes detrimentally. Mm -hmm. Like I am so afraid to <laughs> assume too much. Right. Um that it kind of it can make me kind of useless. And I like I notice this the most at my mom's or at my boyfriend's mom's house. Um, <laughs> where I'm just like so concerned. <laughs> about being the right amount of polite and the right amount of oh. not touching things. <laughs> please don't, please like me. I'm afraid of you. Uh, so I do, I do try to, to be courteous overall, thoughtful in those, like the, those kind of anonymous in-person interactions sure. um, at the grocery store, you know, um, <laughs> it's, and even even if I feel shitty, like if I am having a bad, can I swear on your stream? Oh no! Absolutely, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have the mouth of a sailor, <laughs> and I always forget. But yeah, like if I'm having a bad day, mm -hmm. and I have to go to Target and buy groceries, and I have eleven items, and I can't use the self checkout, and I'm like, oh. I have to now interact with a human being. I am going to put all of that away and. Hey, how's it going? Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Have a good rest of your week. Bye. You know, and turn on that customer service voice. <laughs> so um, I, I guess quick question, because you're you saying that makes me wonder, are you good at making your own appointments or do you get nervous in situations like that? I get nervous in situations like that. <laughs> I do. Uh, this is a true story. Anytime that I have to make a an important professional adult phone call, 
like uh-huh. to make a dentist appointment or to call my doctor or whatever, I have to write down like a script for myself. I have to give myself lines. I have to like, I have to write down these bullet points because like, I'm also, I'm so afraid that I'm going to forget something or, or repeat myself, or I'm going to be so like stuck on, um, like, I have to make sure that I ask him about, about this, this, and this, and then not pay attention to what they're actively saying to me in the moment. It's a whole thing. I also have severe anxiety and ADHD. So <laughs> these are things that I that I know Ooh. are problems for me. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. That, now, now you're bringing us into a very interesting direction. Social anxiety <laughs> or generalized anxiety? Like, what type of generalized anxiety? Generalized anxiety. Okay. Generalized anxiety. Um... I'm actually like, I feel like I had, I had, I, or I solved the social part of my anxiety a long time ago. Sure. And that's where the customer service voice comes in. <laughs> Have a good evening. Um. <laughs> You're like, I mastered the customer service voice. It's done and ready. It's your social anxiety, like being able to deal with people. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um. But then like explaining... Well, and then, yeah, and then the other, the other side of that too, though, is, uh, I can get through anonymous interactions, sure. uh, you know, easily. And then me trying to explain how my anxiety manifests to my neurotypical partner. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I sound insane right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, through that, and I, and I think this is a very interesting point, uh, just overall is, that aspect of communication, because first off, if you have a diagnosis, right? Uh, for example, I, and I'm very open about this. I deal with seasonal depression from time to time. Even as a psychologist, you know, I'm very aware of what I deal with. Um, and still communicating that with like your partner or whatnot. Uh, sometimes it can be, you don't know how your partner may react. And g- g- mental health disorders and mental health diagnoses are luckily being destigmatized slowly but there's still mm-hmm. some stigma around it. So for yourself, how is that? Or how has that journey been for you to bring that up and talk about that with your partners, with family, with whoever that may be? Oh, goodness. It came about with my... I started talking to to my family about it when I started um, going to therapy mid-late 2020. Mm-hmm. Because like I had been, I had been on and off um, antidepressants in college. Sure. And never like talk to them about it. Um, <laughs> I didn't know how to broach that <laughs> that topic. <laughs> but then when I uh, I was I lived with my parents during COVID, and I you know started started doing therapy on Zoom, you know, or yeah. well not on Zoom, but you know the the actual like uh, whatever HIPAA compliant portal that I can do it remotely through. <laughs> right. And I just. The only way that I stopped being afraid of bringing it up was to just state it as a fact. Like, yeah, I just, I, I'm starting therapy. Like, I have, ther- I have therapy weekly now. Like, that's what's happening. My dad, mm-hmm. I think, is where I got all of my things from. I'm, I'm almost certain my dad is anxious. I'm certain my dad deals with depression. I'm certain he, he has ADHD and has never known it. Sure. Um, and my, my mom is more neurotypical. And she will try to, she, she tries to understand and is getting better. But when it's, when she started asking me questions about, about therapy and everything, it was like, she would, she would say something to the effect of like, I just wonder if there's anything that I could have done differently when you were growing up. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like the fact that I am like seeking out and getting healthy, uh, help for this. Right. I'm like, mom, I could be on heroin, and I'm not. You did great. Yeah. <laughs> You're a great mom. <laughs> I mean, okay, I just made the bar sound really low, but come on. <laughs> but but even through that, that's, uh, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, first off, you're a very, yeah, like successful, if I might say, you know, individual that people can look up to. So I think your mom did a great job uh, in seeing where you are at the moment. 
But the, I don't know. Being on heroin sounds like fun. No, chat. No. <laughs> I can't believe I need to say this. Don't do heroin. Right? Gosh, chat. <laughs> Beer before liquor. Don't do heroin. <laughs> Is that the saying? Okay. <laughs> um Yes, uh, real quick in the chat, someone says you can inherit this stuff. You can. And this is why mm -hmm. whenever you go into like therapy or like a psychologist appointment, we do a bit a brief like background history or background assessment into your family history. Um, there, There's a lot of mental health uh, diagnoses and stuff that can be passed down, um, including but not limited towards BPD. Uh, symptoms of ADHD can present themselves from pet, like parental figures on down. A lot, like you can think about it, anxiety, depression symptoms, so on and so forth. Um, Especially when like so many uh, of these disorders overlap in the way that their symptoms present. And they're all, like everything is a little bit related to everything else. Right. R exactly. So w with that, ooh, okay. Now, now you're prepping me up really, really nicely. Ooh. I appreciate that. So let, let me ask you, I guess... The you that you are today, right? If we can go ahead and just look back at, say, younger you, what piece of advice or what would you tell yo the younger version of you um, that you feel really needs to go ahead and hear? Uh, nobody is thinking about you as much as you are afraid they are thinking about you. Ooh, okay. Like, everybody is thinking about how everyone is thinking about them. Sure. Nobody has time to think about you the way that you're afraid. <laughs> and then if you had any questions for a future version of you, what questions would you ask them? Did we stop being codependent? Oof. To the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Are we over that yet? Well, that that's interesting that you bring that up. And now I, now I gotta, I gotta dig a little bit there. Let's talk to invest in. <laughs> <laughs> Do the Mavs win? Do the Mavs win? Go to your past self, invest in Bitcoin, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, a uh, question for you then is, seeing as though, like, you know, a lot of these symptomology doesn't go away. Anxiety, um, you know, we, we can manage a lot of our symptoms to the best of our abilities or even subside them to the best that we can. Do you feel like you're like maybe an aspect of your anxiety is what causes you to attach or maybe become a little codependent? Uh, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I, I am an anxious attacher mm -hmm. um, on top of everything else. And I have I have I have chased people uh, in my past, sure. um, <laughs> which has I don't want to say worked out uh, ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's sometimes it's worked it's never worked out fair yeah right yeah uh <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know how i don't know what more to what more to elaborate no no, on no. That about <laughs> and, and that's fine because uh, like again like everything that you go into i'm like okay because that's interesting because for me it's like so then have you taken any rough lessons from always being the chaser or chasing in that regard Oh goodness, yes. Um I at a certain point I realized like what I was looking for and what I was expecting and what I was anticipating out of like these relationships that I was pursuing um were things that I can't realistically expect from another person. Right. And I recalibrated Jan well, let me see January of 2023. I went to a month-long Shakespeare acting intensive in Massachusetts. Um, and it was the methodology of this, um, this acting company is centering yourself and focusing on your feelings and how you react to things and how you process things and not blocking it and allowing those things to flow through you in whatever way they come up. Right. And it was extremely helpful and healthy for me. Um, I mean, I came out of there. I loved living that way and living right. that open and that raw, but it's also so unsustainable in like a regular day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I took a lot of those practices. And, and one of the things that I said when I was there, I was like, I am here to make 
myself the most important person in my life for a little bit and understand the things that are that are in me so and that's really and that's interesting right because a big portion and there's a big saying that we often hear which is you got to learn how to love yourself or be able to go ahead and like understand your raw mm-hmm. emotions before or your emotions in general before putting them onto others mm-hmm. which which brings in the, i guess the the next element of the the second part i guess which is what do you think has been the key to your happiness so far then understanding that a lot of things that have hurt me are not about me everybody else is dealing with their own shit right and by and large i would say when somebody hurts you it's so much more about about them than it is about you and it has made me a much more forgiving person mm-hmm. um it has allowed me to move on Right. Um, much easier from a lot of different things. Like, I I used to take everything so personally. Right. I used to take everything so personally. And the biggest, like, the biggest thing that I've internalized is, it's not about you, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a weird, it's a weird type of narcissism. Right. To be afraid, like, come on, Maddie. <laughs> like come on maddie again like not everybody is thinking about you that much it's okay you see for me that it's really really interesting because it's and you can always feel free to correct me if i'm wrong or whatnot but it sounds as though you were putting a lot of pressure on yourself as a kid like there was a lot of cognitive distortions uh, a lot of anxiety a lot of everything that just kept you kept stockpiling onto yourself until, you know, you maybe started addressing it later on throughout your adulthood. Gosh, yeah. Oh, gosh. A lot of my, um, <laughs> I, I think a, a lot of my anxiety as a, as a kid, like an, mm. as an adolescent, was trying to live up to my brother, my big brother. And who asked me to do that? Who expected me to do that? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> that was something that I invented. This idea that, like, I had to be as good as him at right. all of the same things. And surprise, surprise, we're different people. We like different things. We're good at different things. And right. I can't be him. But I, oh my gosh, this is uh, one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me as a teenager mm. was I had I had expressed that thought, like, uh, you know, oh, I'm only doing this because my brother did it and I have to, like, prove that I'm as smart as my brother or whatever. Right. Um, I said that to my high school physics teacher who was also my brother's high school physics teacher. (laughs) And he latched onto that and made, like, I became his project for the rest of the year. And then, like, right before we graduated, he was like, do you remember when you said this? And I'm like, yes! Like, he sat me down (laughs) in the library and he gave me, like, the most, like, end of the B movie, like, locker room speech, like, motivational speech I've ever heard in my life. Oh, <laughs> And it was really, it was wonderful, yeah, because, I mean, also, he was a physics teacher. I was an art kid. Like, my right. brother was great at physics. My brother's an architect. Like, great, phys- you know, applied math, you know. Um, he is, that is the way in which he is smart. Right. And for my physics teacher to be like, look... <laughs> You don't need to get an A in this class for you to be a worthwhile human being. And I'm like, okay, thank you. Oh, and, and, <laughs> and, and honestly, like teachers, professors have a lot of impact on us growing up, right? I think on a lot of mm-hmm. individuals, uh, they're like the front line of defense whenever it comes to encouraging people to step up and, you know, step out of their shell oh, or yeah. heal or do a thousand and one things. Um, and through that, that's powerful that your professor actually was able to go ahead and share that with you. And also, thank you for being so vulnerable, by the way. Of course, absolutely. I love I love being vulnerable. And I love, like, getting to walk into a room where people are, are open to that and accepting of that. Because I do it kind of a lot anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I overcorrected. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's fun. I think it's fun. Like this is where human connection is. This is why I like the arts. This is why I like acting. Is this is the truth of us? Right. And and, and I think when we go down to the raw elements that make us us, right? This is how we build that that like that those genuine connections that we're talking about. Um, mm-hmm. We share experiences based off of that. Um, 
and, and I guess through that comes in, I, I guess if you don't mind, just like a further exploratory question for you, which is if you were to encapsulate, uh, it's a two part question. Number one, if you could go ahead and like encapsulate your life into a book right now, what title mm. would you give that book? And then the second part is what chapters do you feel have the most written in them in your life story so far? Oh, goodness. Oh, gosh. That's a, such a good question. Wow. Thank you. Because, like, I, I'm thinking about it, and I want to put, you know, I want to I wanna throw out some, you know, perfect short little witticism, but the ones that I'm coming up with, I'm like, like don't, that don't no longer align with my values. Right. <laughs> like, I wouldn't want to call it that anymore. Um, for a minute, I thought about fake it till you make it, because one of the best pieces of advice I'd ever gotten was the trick to being a confident actor is acting the part of a confident person. Right. Cool. And that was true and very helpful for me for a long time. And now it's no longer true for me or helpful for me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it, it helped a lot for a long time. And I do want to like put that back out there. But that was also just a really classy way to say fake it till you make it. Um, right. Oh, Chad saying because you made it. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's very sweet. I got, hey, full disclosure, I got rejected by an agency like two days ago. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, no. Success is fickle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the life of an actor. <laughs> But that's the that's the other thing too is is part of the way that I've made it is uh, not giving a shit about it two days later. Right. I'm like, oh well. You you got to know how to uh, brush it off. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. So well, then I guess yeah, accepting rejection <laughs> would be a pretty a pretty thick part of that book. Oh yeah, and and the second part of that would be um, what chapters in your life do you feel would have the most written in yeah learning learning how to deal with rejection both professionally and and personally and the idea i think that life moves in seasons um okay. because something i mean as i think about it i'm like what if i did what if i did write a book about all of the people that i have been in my life mm -hmm. and even just what I said a minute ago, like, I thought of this title, but it no longer aligns with my values and the person that I am now. And I think I would, it would be important to me to highlight in a book about my life, the fact that I am the exact same person I was when I was 11. And I am also 30 different people that I have been since then. Right. All and the they all still exist in there. Right. I think that's lovely. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to think about that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be thinking about that for like the next two weeks. You're like, oh no, here it comes. <laughs> Your brain's going to hyperfixate. <laughs> <laughs> that, and, and that's an interesting perspective. Uh, and, and again, so, some of these questions, like, yeah, they, they make us think a little bit. They make us uh, self-reflect a little bit in that, which I guess comes, in, comes into my future orientation as well, which is 50, 60, 100 years from now, how do you want people to remember you? She was fun. <laughs> she was fun. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I don't need it to be some grand thing. I don't need it to be, I don't need to be remembered and, and, and canonized, you know, mm -hmm. but I would like for the people that I touched throughout my life as a person or, or as an artist or however, mm -hmm. um, it would be nice if when somebody remembers me, they go, yeah, she was fun. And through that, right, I think uh, your voice will probably live on forever. <laughs> in oh, a, gosh. In a very uh, <laughs> interesting way. In a literal way. way. Yeah, in a literal way. Your voice will literally live on forever for as long as there's the ability to go ahead and uh, keep any of the shows out, like, you know, out there. Yeah, until, until we lose the ability to hold digital media. Exactly. We have Blu-rays. Wild chat. <laughs> <laughs> So, I guess past that comes in my my follow up question, which is you were talking about rejection, right? Um, mm. And it, it's going to be a two parter question on rejection. And I guess the first one I'll go ahead and personalize it, and I'll center in on it, which is <laughs> okay. I, I know, right? You're like, oh gosh, <laughs> like let's uh, buckle up, and buckle up. Chad already knows this. I feel like that's why Chad's like, oh yeah, no, he's he's he's, he's swinging. Um, 
when it comes to, I guess, rejection, do you feel, or first off, what parts of yourself do you feel like you were rejecting if you have rejected any parts of yourself? And number two, um, oh, go ahead. Hmm. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah. And, and number two was going to be for rejection. How has like your parents, brothers, caregivers, you know, helped you in uh, like growing up with dealing with rejection? If there is any part of myself that I myself have rejected over the years, it's the idea, the idea that I can't. Just in general, the idea that I cannot. Now, that's different from knowing that I can't do something. Like, I'm not, I'm not going skydiving. I'm not doing it. It's not happening. Dang it. <laughs> uh, I'm not base jumping. Like, no thanks. But I've rejected the idea in myself that I cannot experience something. I've, I've rejected the idea that I'm that I am not deep enough or not smart enough or not whatever enough to participate in things that mean something to me. And if I feel like I need to be to be better or smarter or you know or whatever at something, then that's something that I can pursue and it doesn't have to be you know flipping a switch. I don't have to I'm reminding myself that I don't have to be immediately good at something right. And that's really tough <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so, and, oh, yes? Well, because uh, I was going to say, like, for me, when you're saying that, and I, again, I might be overstepping here, and you, you can feel free to go ahead and be like, yeah, no, whatever, right? Um, mm. Have you ever had the thought process, you know what, I'm not worthy? Oh, yeah, all the time. God, oh, I got my, I got that rejection letter mm. uh, from the agency, like, two days ago, and it felt like I walked into a metal pole. It was like, I... I closed my laptop and I went and, you know, went for a drive. Like, it's like, I have to go do something else. Um, right. it, it sucked. It hurt. But it's nice to be able to allow myself to sit in that and let right. that let that pass through me. I will give that emotion and that happening the space that it needs to run its course. Right. Like food poisoning. <laughs> and then I'll be good. You know, a little bit of Taco Bell a couple of days, you'll be fine. You'll yeah, be <laughs> it'll be great. Pick up a Pedialyte on the way home. Oh, God. It'll be good. <laughs> but, but, okay. Get those electrolytes. So, it'll be okay. <laughs> my second part with the whole rejection thing was going to be, so that's the internal part of rejection. Now, let's talk a little bit about the social part of rejection. And this is where I'm going to go ahead and start turning it into a little bit of like, you know, the characters that, you, that you've done, which is... Yes. You have a lot of individuals that absolutely love your work, that love Rudius, that love Miko Ino, and all, all these characters that you've voiced, right? But you also have a segment of individuals, for example, that I can immediately tell just if I tried to open up X or Twitter or whatever, <laughs> that there's a strong disdain or distaste towards Rudius, and there's a strong rejection towards the character. Mm -hmm. What are your thought process on that? How have you handled that? At first, it annoyed me. Mm -hmm. because I feel like those people are missing out on an incredible story and incredible growth and, and getting to share in that growth. But I also fully understand why this character would be so immediately off-putting to people. Sure. Um, two of my two of my best friends are uh, a couple that I was uh, friends with in high school. Mm -hmm. And husband friend is super into it and wants like always wants like I don't think he's watching the the anime, but like he was he's been reading the manga and he's like he's got friends who read it and who are interested in it and um we'll we'll talk about it. And wife friend like read the first two chapters or whatever, or like <laughs> heard kind of kind of the overview of who Rudius is when we very first meet him and is like, Nope, I'm out. I don't want to, I don't want to, I know the manga disowned him. Yes, I know. <laughs> I've told him to, but whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I, I get why he's off-putting and I get why somebody would be uncomfortable um, engaging with, with his story. Right. And I don't hold that against anybody, but I would implore them to like, give it a chance. Like this is, and I think, I think part of that too, um, I think part of that rejection, that kind of immediate knee-jerk rejection, is an assumption of what this story is going to be because they know what other anime has been. True. 
<laughs> and it's different. It's different. And uh, Rifujin, even uh, by his own admission, says, like, when he first started releasing this, uh, this novel online, that people really liked the character growth and he was like oh this was going to be a power fantasy like i didn't mean to make it about that but i think i think it was when he released the chapter about roxy taking young rudy outside for the first time and everybody's like whoa overcoming trauma whoa growth dealing with thing like these are real issues this is human um and then he went oh okay maybe i should make the story about that then right (laughs) <laughs> and that's and so it is like, um and it's so i feel like it's so carefully constructed right his growth um and and at its core this is the most basic human fantasy is if you could start over knowing what you know now what would you do differently oh a hundred percent and and yeah, and we're watching that happen in real time with this with this character, and it's just it's fa- it's fascinating. It's fascinating to me. He's fascinating. I'll be honest, and I, I've shared this with chat. I use Moshiko Tensei as a way to like showcase number one, to, especially to a lot of the therapists and whatnot that I have to supervise and uh, other psychologists as well. How to go ahead and because Rudius is not the best of the best, right? If we're gonna be or Earthius, Earth Rudius is not the best of the best, yes. like. He's an individual that is developmentally stunted, has significant amount of trauma, has sexual trauma, which I feel individuals often completely subside, like the fact that Earthius has gone through sexual abuse and sexual trauma. Um, And then, uh, you know, when you start seeing a kid or literally somebody that's been developmentally stunted start acting in the way that like they've been abused, people are like, well, wait a minute, red flag, anime can't touch this. But yet this is stuff that happens every single day out there in the real world. You know, and Mm -hmm. it's a good teaching piece that at least I used to go ahead and be like, hey, this is how like the power of change and how we can go ahead and like look at characters like this and start going ahead and empathizing, finding a way to empathize with them to empathize with some of the clients as well that Mm -hmm. go through this and or worse. And I think it's interesting, too, how little we know about his past life um, before the incident. Right. He was a kid. He was a normal teenager. He was a normal, probably average student, liked nerdy shit. Yep. <laughs> and suffers this extreme public sexual humiliation at 16 years old. You know, like, of course, that's going to of course, that's going to mess you up. Right. Um, and the other thing, too, is that people don't want to accept um, uh, hypersexuality is a trauma response. Um, you see this all the time with um, with women, especially who were victims of rape, right? Um, and especially at a young age. Um, this is a documented thing. This is a documented phenomenon. I get being off put by it and not wanting to engage with with media in your leisure time that deals with these things. Right. (laughs) But I think writing off the story or the character for any reason other than that is in, in the most gentle sense of the word, just ignorant. A hundred percent. And it's like, you're not like you, you're working with half the information. And through that, I always find this kind of funny because even in some of the direct posts that I see of individuals, you know, or just communities that may get together and try and reject or hate on the, Uh, show in general and in the character in general um it's like they want anime to go ahead and advance into elements where it's talking about real life but at the same time they're only praising uh extreme power scale anime where they're yelling at one another for hours on end which hey you do you but through that you touched on something interesting which i found amazing first off they like you completely encapsulate and that you have the knowledge of which is the hypersexuality that can come Mm -hmm. from trauma and then the hyposexuality that can also come from it, which is kind of funny. Uh, when uh, the whole aspect of Rudy getting ED, right? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of individuals, like before that even happened, uh, on. In here, I never, yeah, I never considered that as a as a bookend. Like, gosh, oh wow, he experienced that in both directions. Right, and it, it for me, wow. I was like, that's poetic. <laughs> yeah, and and kind of also goes to show how that manifested in this new body with this new physiology 
and these new hormones. <laughs> and this new like, developing brain. <laughs> and this new developing brain and this, like, wow, holy shit. I never considered that. That is so interesting. That is that is very interesting to, to think about that way. Because he was about the same age right. in this new life. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. That's why, like, you know, lo looking at it and seeing how everything was starting to align, I'm like, this is really beautifully written, especially at the end of... As we were going through, I was already impressed by the series in totality, but seeing the way that it's, you know, juxtaposing or using the dichotomy of like, oh yeah, you know, in one aspect, he has this hypersexualization that happened from trauma. On this other aspect, you know, uh, miscommunication and trauma, again, causes hyposexuality mm -hmm. again. Um, but then, of course, people started to go in and hate on the fact that we now have a character who's depressed and dealing with ED. So yeah. for yourself, getting into these situations, first off, what was your thought about the character as you were reading into it and as you were trying to go ahead and portray all these different emotions, the ups, the downs, the everything in between? I am very fortunate to have spent so much time with this character mm -hmm. from from minute one. He's my son. <laughs> He's my boy. He's my baby. And there were things that I was going through and things that were happening to me, there were si things that were simultaneously happen happening to me and that I was healing from in the midst of all of this when we started season one. Mm -hmm. And I clung to him in these moments. Right. Um, and got, I, I had the privilege of being able not only to grow w with him and, and step through his growth with him, but it felt like, you know, holding my own hand, working through my shit, and seeing so many parallels between between things that happened to him and things and, and, and things in his relationships that he deals with and remembering things that happened to me or things that happened to 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 people that I that I knew or people that I've loved in my life and, you know, understanding their trauma from a, a new way, a new angle. It's I feel very, very close to Rudeus. And after the way that he thinks about himself and thinks about his romantic relationships in the wake of Eris leaving him is, I think, my favorite moment of his growth. <laughs> because it's also, yeah, because it's also something that, like, that is something that I constantly work on with myself. Mm -hmm. is how to move past things that didn't work out. I, I guess through that, right, because you're highlighting so many beautiful aspects here of you know, how, because also done a lot of theater plays and acting and whatnot. And sometimes those characters can really touch us in the mo and like we grow with the characters along the way. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess a key aspect that I want to go ahead and highlight through that is seeing, I, I guess, how often do you see aspects of yourself in the Rudeus or in these characters? And then for you, is there a particular moment that stands out for you where you're like, you may be, for example, people are highlighting your fight with Soul that was amazing. They absolutely love. Oh, the, gosh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, the chat was going off about it for quite a little bit there. But through that, like, is there an aspect of self that stands out for you? Maybe a memory or an experience where you're like, you were saying the lines, you were in the, in the, in the room, maybe you watched it afterwards, or maybe even before when you were reading the script, that you're like, this is, this is me. Or maybe this is what, I, what I'm growing from. It's not. I think a one-to-one -one comparison. This is not this is not a comparison I want to draw between Rudy and Paul and my relationship with my own father. Sure. These are not <laughs> the same thing. But um, the the fight with Paul in season one right. really really stands out to me. It it hit at either exactly the wrong or exactly the right time, and I. I cried all the way through that reading the book, and I cried all the way through that watching the episode uh, subbed. I cried when I was adapting the episode, and I cried when I was standing in the booth doing it. Like, it was a lot. It was a lot. And it was it was a lot in this way of, like, it, 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 I was allowed to feel very raw sure. in this idea of, why is nothing I do good enough for you? And I don't, again, I don't want to act like... You know, 
That's not a thing that I need to hash out with my own father in real life. Right. <laughs> um, that that idea. Why isn't this? Why isn't this good enough for you? Is just a recurring theme in my head my entire life. Like, what did I? Like, how did I fall short? Why wasn't this good enough? How could I have? How could I have done better? You fucking you tell me what I should have done. And but then and then also knowing like and then also having that that character that I'm speaking to be your father figure right that does that does give it an additional little layer and then and then i start doing meisner uh <laughs> <laughs> in my head yeah it's that's my that's my favorite scene i've worked on that i never want to watch again oh <laughs> <laughs> you're like and i'm never touching that again <laughs> Actually, also the mm. episode where uh, Rudy has to help Eris learn to dance. That was adorable. When they're kids, <laughs> when every like when everything is okay, relatively. Right. <laughs> um. Yeah, and and she like she runs away, and he comes and finds her, and is talking about like, uh, I'm not automatically, you know, like he's saying, I'm not I'm not automatically good at everything, you know. Uh, if something is hard for me, you know. The harder something is, the better I feel when I, when I finally get it. Right. Um, and I often need to be reminded of that too. So through that, I guess I'll, I'll jump into this as well, because now you're, I, I think some of the scenes and just in general, the way that everything's written, the way that you portrayed the character really showcases an element of humanity. Right. And like, there's uh, and I think this is what separates an actor between like an, an actor and a great actor, right? Uh, is drawing those experiences from yourself and being able to feel the emotions that the individual may be going through, being able to go ahead and take that apart. And I feel like both episode 16, 17 of season one, meeting with Paul, mm -hmm. um, soul fight with soul that I can go so, so on, so forth. But like the amount of times that I think you've made people emotional and that you made people be there in the moment with you throughout the entire ride that is Moshiko Tensei has been absolutely phenomenal um, in what, in the way that you've done, in how you've Gosh. portrayed the character and how you've allowed individuals to empathize, grow with the character, and even be vulnerable for a second. Because I feel if anything, chat can go ahead and agree with me on this. There's been times where even like as myself looking at, I'm like, I understand the reasoning logically, like why everything's going on, but we're all tearing up in here. We're all crying. We're all, you know, in our fields <laughs> yeah. for a moment. Yeah. There. And that, that's powerful. And, and, and that, that, I don't know, for me, I consider you to be a, a great actress of absolutely amazing individual hey. oh, that can goodness. get a, that can get us to experience these emotions. So in comes in my, I guess, my follow-up question for you, which is for Rudy is, right, as, as a character that he is, what do you wish was a misconception? Or maybe what do you wish that people would take away from his character? That nobody is irredeemable. And I think, you know what? And I think this is true of just everything in general. Not just people, but everything. There is a difference between this is bad and this is not for me. Right. Um, I would like, I would like people to internalize that. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and like I, look if somebody wants to go watch their power fantasy you know anime i'm not gonna stop them right they're well within their right but if i i do get frustrated when i see people presenting this story as something that it's not yeah i was about to say I okay somebody imagine. somebody points out mass genociders are irredeemable yes you are correct <laughs> true caveat thank you for pointing that out <laughs> little asterisk little asterisk there I love this background that you have. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. That and the cool font. I like that typeface. You like the typeface with it? <laughs> I do. It's so good. Graphic design is my passion. <laughs> so I was going to say, well, with that, hi, chat. We're back. And we are back. Yes, I love Metal Gear Solid. It's actually the game that inspired me to become a psychologist. And is it really? Yeah. Uh, I, my brother would force me to watch him play and my cousins when I was like a little kid, like two or three years old. Uh -huh. And they would literally be like, here, you got to play this game while we go to school. And I had to figure out how to play the game and I would listen to them <laughs> talk. And yeah, it just really got me into digging in deeper about, uh, what makes us us, I guess. So graphic cool. design is your hobby. Oh no, that's just a meme. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my dad is a graphic artist though. He has been for my whole life. Um, oh wow! 
uh, and I like I like having an eye for design mm -hmm. because of you know because of my dad like that's fun that's a cool thing that I learned through kind of osmosis um, but I also hate it because when I there's a font that's garbage I see it everywhere <laughs> you like, like pick that up. design suddenly really sticks out or like if there's a t-shirt that's printed like too low like the design's printed too low I'm like literally unwearable yeah yeah <laughs> actually <laughs> question for you Being... design is my burden <laughs> yes it is papyrus correct the dallas zoo is littered with papyrus comic sans is fine stop using it on corporate notices oh yes please <laughs> <laughs> so question for you being neural spicy and all all right. <laughs> uh, have you noticed? I don't know how, to, how else to frame this. So I'm just going to go ahead and shoot it out there, right? Have you noticed yeah. a difference in the way that you approach, uh, say, characters, ideas, storylines, beats, so on and so forth, compared to your non neural spicy individuals? Um, I don't, straight up, I don't know a whole lot of other actors who are neurotypical. But I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't say that there's any difference in approach. I mean, mm. I think that all comes from just your philosophy on acting at that point. Sure. I think that there are different ways to achieve all the things. I mean, then, and then you're getting into, well, then you're getting into acting versus mimicry. And then if you go into acting, then you're getting into, you know, Stanislavski versus Meisner. And then yeah. <laughs> method acting is fake and garbage. And I, uh, I don't believe in it. Um, but <laughs> I guess that is, I guess that is the answer. I'm like that doesn't answer the question, but I guess that is the answer is, I think it's, I don't think it's a matter of our diagnoses <laughs> as right. much as just our approach <laughs> to craft. Well, and the reason why I ask this is just like, for example, um, I don't know how else to frame it. Oftentimes they've seen and you're, you're right, a lot of, I have, majority of individuals that I've known that have gone into like acting, theater, uh, film, so on and so forth, have all been a little neuro spicy in, in the greatest of ways. It's fantastic. Um, so I, I guess my follow-up question for this would be, and I say follow-up, but it's, an, it's heading in a different direction before we jump right back into it, is, mm -hmm. okay, uh, boom, I don't know, the man god appears in front of you and says, hey... I'm going to give you one of two choices. Number one, um, everyone gets to keep their memories of you, but you forget all of your memories, all of your experiences. Or number two, you get to keep all of your memories and experiences, but everyone else around you completely forgets all their memories with you. What do you prefer and why? This is a, what a gross question. Uh, I was like, <laughs> when you, when you started it with, with man God, I was like thinking of a way to like get out of it. Hmm. Mm, but I, was, I don't but like that's the man just God. A, that's just a straight up and down would you rather and i think it's they're both bad um they're both rough decisions absolutely <sighs> the, yeah i don't know I, i'm just like i'm i'm blue screened um i think i would rather go like that let's a start over let's start over let's let's uh eternal sunshine me wipe sure. it Sure, let's wipe, wipe it. it. All. <laughs> I would rather it be I would rather it be me than everybody else. Sure. Ooh. I also Ooh. trust that my friends and family love me enough to like <laughs> fill a bitch in. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, uh, my my biggest fear from that is you have a toxic ex that comes back and is like, but you've always loved me. <laughs> uh, uh -oh. God, that would be so hard. Yeah. The one that would do that, it would be so hard to pull it off. Oh, would it? <laughs> yeah. well i'm not afraid i ain't scared of no things well it's a good thing it sounds like you have a really good support network then that's gonna go ahead and stop I uh... do. Yeah. <laughs> these these individuals from coming in can't have a toxic ex if you don't have an ex at all could be a friend also not even romantically <laughs> that is a big brain play though right right um, but through that, okay, so there's a, a list of questions that chat has for you that they've been preparing. I'm just going to go through, see what yeah. you think of it, and we'll, can you adopt me? It would be cool. No, not that question. No, <laughs> it's getting thrown out of are the you, way. Are you a small cat? Oh, are you a cat person? Ah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll adopt you if you're a small cat. If you could identify Rudius as a fruit, which one would it be and why? A fruit? Yeah. <laughs> a coconut. A coconut. Um, what 
team are you? Team Sylphie, Roxy, or Eris, and why? I think Roxy, because I understand why why she's an object of worship to to Rudeus, and she. I think there's something really beautiful that she doesn't know how much she did for him by taking him outside the fucking gate. Like, there, and there's something I don't know. There's something lovely that. You know, she did this beautiful, saintly thing, and she has absolutely no idea how important it was. Right. Roxy's my girl. Roxy's your girl. I'm glad she's coming back. I have a theory on That's her. That's my wife! <laughs> I have a theory on her that, like, I feel like chat's been going crazy about. Um, I don't really tend to read ahead, so I don't really know what, what, what will come. Ooh, but, okay. I, but I have a theory, and I, I guess I'm going to ask you this. Is Rudy about to relapse? Because all the points are point, like all the signs are pointing towards him relapsing and Roxy being there to take care of him for that. I'm not sure how to answer that. What are, like, what are the spoiler rules here? You can choose to answer however you want to answer. Chat's the only one that has the, the major spoiler rules, I guess. That's why they're throwing up the rat. Dude, uh, y'all, I told my director about the rat the other day in my session the other day uh oh, I have that a was question. very exciting is he going to relapse i without elaborating at all i will say yes wonderful okay <laughs> um and if i madeline morris am mm -hmm. codependent sylphie yeah then i totally get it like i'm totally on board <laughs> like i under i understand everything that happens next like <laughs> I may not agree with it. I may not think it was the right decision, but I understand why everything that happens happens. I love the way that you're just like, I get it. <laughs> my, my, it's my son. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's my son. Oh. So, what was your first? Uh, what are what are your favorite animes actually? Uh, this one, um, <laughs> yeah. one of my favorites that really launched me into being an anime fan was mm -hmm. Yu Yu Hakusho. Ooh, okay. Um, uh, back on, when that was on Toonami. Yeah. Um, let me look around my, let me look around my room. I'm sitting, I'm at my parents' house. I'm in my childhood bedroom right now. Oh. Surrounded by anime shit from when <laughs> I was a kid. So let's see, what do I have? I have Sayuki. And I've got Full Metal Alchemist and nice. Assassination Classroom. Assassination Classroom. Assassination Classroom. Assassination Classroom has to be like in my top three of all time. Uh, is Kurama my favorite Yu Yu Hakusho character? Yes or yes? No, it is Hiei. <laughs> I am sorry. Tsunami was a shit chat. <laughs> Man, Tsunami was so great. Those afternoon years. Oh, yeah. Ugh, I'd get off the bus. Ugh. I was the first, my stop, my bus stop coming home from school was the very first stop every day. It was the first oh. stop on the route. So I got home and I would only miss about five minutes of Toonami. Oh, nice. Awesome. I remember running home and like turning it on and literally staying all the way until Toonami ended before Adult Swim came on. And I was like, ah, oh, this is, this is great. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to catch up on Naruto or Inuyasha yeah. or anything. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Inuyasha. I really loved Inuyasha. Yeah, Mushoku, Assassination Classroom, Yu Yu Hakusho, Revolutionary Girl Utena, classic. You said Utena. No, I got scared for a second because there's another character named Utena at the moment that I think a lot of people know about. Uh-oh. <laughs> big O. Utenami went big. Uh, gushing over magical girls. Yeah, chat's going wild with it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Revolutionary Girl Utena mentioned. Yep. Um, so th the next question that I have in here is, uh, did you watch or read Moshiko Tensei before, prior to getting the role of Rudeus? Uh, so this is, this all kind of happened at the same time. Um, it was, let me set the stage for you. Sure. Uh, it was late 2020. Mm -hmm. I was, it was mid December of 2020. The anime industry was just starting to figure out how it was going to work over the pandemic. And so people were starting to get jobs again. And shows were going to start up. I happened to see um, a trailer for this show. I don't know why. I don't know why I watched the trailer. Right. Um, but I texted a friend who's an employee who worked on the writing, the full-time writing team at Crunchyroll, mm -hmm. which, or at the time Funimation. 
And I said, hey, if there needs to be overhire this season, I would love to write this show. Like, like even kind of kind of jokingly, really, I was like, hey, tell tell them that I want this. Like, right. tell them, give it, tell them, give it to me. And I'm like, I'm not an employee. I get, I get called, like, I do only get called when there's overflow work. Right. Um, and there's never a guarantee that there will be any. And then I get a text a couple of days later that's like, hey, do you want to do the scripts for Mushoku Tensei? Cool. And I said, I do. And I like, I texted my friend again and I said, what happened? Like, they just offered it to me. And uh, she goes, oh, yeah, we had a meeting and everybody looked at it and went, oh, that's an isekai harem show. I don't want to write that. And I went, well, Maddie said she wants it. And everybody just said, okay. <laughs> because of the reputation of these genres, everyone else passed on this show. Wow. <laughs> and I, I'd seen the trailer and I fell in love. I was So I was like, great. Okay, let's do it. And this was right before Christmas break. Right. And so I I got on Amazon and I bought the first three books and I immediately st I devoured them. Um, and I was really excited. And I was like, I wrote the first, I think the first episode over New Year's or something. Mm -hmm. It was exactly, it was everything I needed. I loved doing it. It was so exciting. It was so much fun. I really sunk into these books. I found out that Jeremy Inman was going to be the director. Right. And I texted him and I said, hey, I have never written a script for you before. Can I come shadow a few of these sessions sure. um, so I get a feel for your style, how you want, you know, the dialogue to flow, um, you know, how just I want to know how you prefer things. And he goes, oh, well, you don't need to come shadow because uh, I kind of wanted you to be in it. Oh, <laughs> and I went, oh. I was like, oh, okay, shit. Okay, cool. Um, neat. And I'm thinking one of the girls, because right. up at, until this point, I had never played a boy right. in anime for more than about two lines. And I was like, I was like, which of these girls would be fun to to audition for? And <laughs> uh then a couple hours later he texts me again and he goes, How's your boy voice? And I went, Oh shit. <laughs> it's like I don't know. Nobody's ever booked it, and I, you know, got I jumped in the booth and and recorded, you know, just a, a little bit of thing, a little snippet for him, and I sent it to his email, and he was like, "Great, come play Rudius." Whoa! Um, and I was like, "Ah, oh, shit, okay." Ah, uh, the other the other weird thing that was happening at this time is I was so fucking depressed. <laughs> Right. At this time, that I was genuinely considering quitting acting. Whoa. And and that plus my insecurity about playing this particular part in this particular show, I spent the entire first two episodes. So there's about there's about three or four weeks of time mm -hmm. when this um when this show kicked up where I could feasibly have dropped out of the show. And I wow. still wanted to write it. I still wanted to do the scripts. I still wanted to be in for that because, like, it. I was so I was so into that. Like, I was sold. The puzzle of it was beautiful. I was having fun doing that. Right. I didn't trust myself as an actor. Mm -hmm. And up until we had episode two in the can, I thought yeah. about like I could quit today. Today could be the day. I could still back out. I could still back out. Like, there's still time. They could find. They could still replace me. Um, and I just dragged my feet on it too long. <laughs> and went, well, I guess I'm in it forever now. <laughs> and it's been genuinely one of the most fulfilling artistic experiences of my life to to be able to engage with this material on this level and to this extent for this long. Right. Um, and I feel I'm very grateful that I am too lazy and afraid of confrontation to quit a job. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm saving you this time. <laughs> oh. Can't keep getting away with this. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's weird. So that's the story. <laughs> but that's a wild story. <laughs> like, yo. Have, yeah, that was about like that was about five weeks of my life from start to finish. Wow. Um, from the time that I saw the trailer to the time that I was committed to doing the show. 
<laughs> there you it's go. A month and a half. That was the holidays. That was Christmas and New Year's, baby. <laughs> chat, chat was saying you had your own depression, ma- depressed magician arc. <laughs> I did. I have one every like three years, man. Oh. Catch me, catch me in December, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's not good. <laughs> Is it the holidays that affect you? Holiday time. No, I love the fucking holidays. That's what really pisses me off about it. I'm like, goddamn seasonal depression. Like, I am supposed yeah. to be holly and I am told jolly. <laughs> You're like, there's no jolly. There is no jolly there. Aww. Like, there's no, there is no Christmas spirit. There is gloom. I am a Scrooge. And then I watch Muppet Christmas Carol and I'm cured for another three days <laughs> for another three days <laughs> yeah and then i have to pick something else so comes in another yeah. question here that's i, I see t- i see two di- like people are messaging me all over like ask this question ask that question uh in the chat says how did you prepare for the morning after the heiress scene or heiress leaving Ooh. scene you know what we did we recorded those scenes uh, and this is why I like working with with Inman in particular, um, mm-hmm. the the lead director on this show, is he will let me record full scenes at a time. Like some right. some directors like will go like line by line, some will go in little chunks. Um, Inman will highlight an entire scene and will preview the whole scene in context, and then I'll record the whole thing. Oh wow! And it's really nice to have that flow and have that build. Right. Um, because the entire conversation before Eris and Rudy asleep together for the first time is deeply vulnerable. Right. Um, and in the context of not only their, you know, trauma bonding, but that it's it's your it's your first love, you know? Right. And you, you know, you just think about that. Like, think about who, who you had a crush on when you were 13. Right. Think about how much, like, I, ju- I don't know. I just, I just put myself back in that, in that headspace. And you let yourself go there and you let yourself think about like, wow, yeah, I remember how important, how vastly important this moment, like, would have been for me. And getting to be... You know, getting to play in that very like heightened childlike um, intensity mm-hmm. really carries over on you, and it's it's very intense. It's very uh, it's very heavy, mm-hmm. and when it suddenly comes crashing down in the very next scene when she's gone, oh, break my heart. <laughs> and it just, I just rode the wave. I just, you just exist with the moment and it, it got to me. It's sad. It hurts. Like <clears throat> I can only imagine, I have to imagine like what that would feel like having this taken away from you. Right. And that's, I don't know. It's just not something it's just, not, I don't take, I don't take feelings lightly. <laughs> that's why I'm an actor. <laughs> like feelings are very <laughs> important to me. <laughs> <laughs> So on that same line, they came back and they asked, do you fear Eris's eventual return as a, as a voice act? Well, why would I? Right. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, unless that means something about what is going to happen in that scene that I'm not aware of yet. Oops. Uh-oh. I don't know. I haven't read that far. Ooh. Okay. Um, but I will say I love working with Lindsay Seidel, who's mm-hmm. the dub voice actor for Eris. Um, I think I've said Lindsay is so talented that she makes me want to quit acting. Uh, I'm just like, I'll just, I'll never be as good, but we keep getting to be in things together, which just delights me no end. I think she's phenomenally talented and, and really skilled. And she is one of those actors that makes you better right. just by nature of, of being there with you. It's good shit. It's good, good shit. shit. She's so good. I can't wait for her to come back. I can't wait for more of that character. Speaking of characters, uh, another quick question that came in is, other than Rudius, who is your favorite Moshiko Tensei character and why? I wonder if it is Eris. It might be Eris. Is it Eris? I don't know if it's Eris. <laughs> I like Eris in that Demon Continent arc. I'm a little actually less interested in grown-up Eris. Ooh, I don't okay. know. Uh, who is my favorite character? Is it Rui Shard? Is Rui Shard best girl? 
Is Rougeard the best girl? I'm kind of obsessed with Rougeard. How so? Um, now, now I'm curious. Why so? What, what about Rougeard speaks out to you? <laughs> the, I mean, very literal demonization of an entire group of people. And I don't know, there's something about that that tragic noble hero trope that that gets to me a little bit and i don't know i just like the i like his uh his kind of uh my god what have i done backstory that's that for me is like the he for me is the equivalent of um all of the girls you knew in middle school um <laughs> uh whose favorite character was zuko fair that's what Rouge, that's what rouge is to me rouge is my zuko so i have another one here uh they, they mentioned, I think that this would be extremely educational for Maddie to explain the different steps of how production works, uh, the different steps like what does a translator do, what does the adaptive writer do, what are the different target audiences for dubs and, stuff, uh, and subs, if you know, what are the guiding principles for translation in this industry? Those are, all, that's a lot of very big questions. Um, mm -hmm. so I will answer as much of that as I can. Those are all very good questions. Right. Uh, I will answer as much of them as I can, as thoroughly as I can without either rambling or boring everybody. Feel free. <laughs> um, cause these are, uh, this can get technical. Uh, okay. So the steps, okay. So the steps of production, as far as producing a dub, we will get materials delivered from Japan that mm -hmm. are sent to, uh, an in-house or freelance translator. Um, generally there will be one translator assigned to, to one show that material will go to the translation, the official translation, whatever is when the translation is finalized, that is the translation that will be used both for the adaptive writer to launch off of and for the official subtitles online, mm -hmm. which I think there's, I have an opinion about that. Sure. I'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> The official translation and the video uh, with a time code burned in are sent to ADR Prep, um, and they will create a template for the script that includes the translation, the official translation, um, and that will get sent to the adaptive writer, in this case, me or Jared Smith. Uh, Jared Smith, voice of Paul, uh -huh. um, is, is co-writing uh, this season. Wow. <laughs> He's having a good time. Right. Yeah, so uh, the adaptive writer will get the, the raw translation, the official translation, and the time-coded script and massage that text mm -hmm. into both something that is synced to the, the animation, mm -hmm. to the mouth flaps, and massage for, for good flow of conversation in the scene. I wish I, had, I wish I had examples on me. I need to like have a file of these, <laughs> um, but there are instances where a translated line can sound translation-y, just stilted or like that doesn't, sound like a thing anybody would actually say in English. Like, sure. I understand what this line means. I understand what this character is saying. Nobody in real life would talk like that kind of a thing. Right. And by and large, that is what a lot of the adaptation that I do is, is making it more conversational. With Mushoku Tensei, especially because I uh, read the novels. Mm -hmm. I always have them on hand when I am working on a script so I can double check uh, context or subtext for a line or for uh, a conversation. Um, there will be clues in the animation itself. Right. Like even just the, the last episode that I worked on, Elena Lise has a line where her expression is described in the novel, in the novel, mm -hmm. um, and obviously drawn on screen, but the way that it's drawn on screen is not how I would have interpreted the text of the novel if I hadn't had both to look at. And then I go, sure. oh, okay, so then we need to make it sound like X, Y, Z. We need to make it sound more more of a, more concerned. We need to make it sound more relieved. We need to make it sound more joking. We need to make it sound more meh. Right. And if I'm lucky, sometimes I will get to slide in an additional reference or some extra context from the book or reference to something in the book or phrasing in the book that didn't make it into the anime. And that's often fun. There's an episode in se early in season one, Ben Phillips and I, Ben who plays Rudy's inner voice, mm -hmm. he and I have Skyrim and Legend of Zelda references in our lines back to back. Right. Because it's fun. Right. Because it's fun. <laughs> 
So and also and also like the only person who should be able to make references to things that are actually real is Rudius. Rudy, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, come on. I mean, that makes sense. That that absolutely makes sense. So I have a two parter question here for you, and actually, okay. oh, thank you for going so in depth with it because it really clarifies at least the process for us. The first yeah. question. Oh, they is, also they also asked about like standards for for translation and localization. Correct. And that is very that's a whole that's a whole like hour long lecture <laughs> that somebody smarter than i should answer for you but i will actually can i drop somebody's twitter account in the chat real absolutely quick? feel free there is a localizer that i have been following mm -hmm. on twitter for a bit who tweets very good threads oh yeah people are like i need to watch the full dub now i'm sold fully completely i'm so yeah. happy it's in good hands <laughs> Join us! So it's Katrina L. Translator on mm -hmm. Twitter. Um, she is a, a localization specialist. She's a genius. Um, and she has really good threads on on, on, on localization and translation standards um, in, in manga. Oh, wow. It's awesome, but yeah, she's a great she's a great resource to learn about all of those things. Much uh, much smarter than than I am on on all of that. Uh, being that she also does speak and read Japanese, <laughs> right? But and I don't. <laughs> but even through that, like the the next two questions, one of them I guess you might have answered already, but I just want to make sure that we touch on it because it's being asked a lot. Which is how much freedom do you have when it comes to you know any sort of, of adaptive writing or translating, whatever that may be? I like. I would. I would like to say a lot, but that's. Because I I prefer to approach it creatively. Um, right. There are, and I think this is I think this is a pitfall of the job where people say, "Oh, we can't stray too far from the translation," mm -hmm. and oftentimes the easiest solution is to just edit that exact line of dialogue as translated until it fits the animation. Right. And that can that can be fine. That can work out. It often comes off as stilted or vague. Mm -hmm. Ooh, well, here's here's a little insight that I think explains that too. Sure. Um, English is a low context language, where oh. I can craft a sentence with exactly the right words in exactly the right order to give you exactly the right nuance. Like I can say, I can use the words in an order to construct exactly what I mean. Um, low context language. You don't right. need to know anything about the sentence before I give you the sentence. Japanese is an extremely high context language where the same words in the same order could be eight different sentences in eight different tenses, verb oh, tenses. Wow. Yeah. Depending on the context, depending on who's around. Um, so there are often a lot of what you would call a direct or literal translation of a Japanese line that is vague right. and confusing. And if you don't use context clues to figure out what that's going to be, uh, then your dub script will come off, or will or can come off as vague or confusing. Having that's that's another that's another reason too why having these novels can be invaluable. Having right. them on hand um, because not only is it two different translations from two different minds of the same dialogue of the same text um it's there's so many things in the novel that are elaborated on right and just god thank god these these books have been translated i'm so grateful to have to have these as a resource and to enjoy them they're fun to read they're right. just fun to read some some of the like the chapters that i read and this is actually what i what i really really like about the books is they're in layman's terms. Like it's not like we're reading Shakespeare, right? Yes. And that's yes. That is actually what speaks out to me is like, hey, when we're reading through something like this, it's just very simple to pick up and go through, and we don't have to go ahead and overanalyze. And uh, so speaking of that, they're they're really demanding this, which is how do you think the voice might be changed if a third season or fourth season is announced, considering if Rudius keeps getting older. Uh, do you think that the voice will change or not? Is it going to be you that's still playing him? Or, you know, what what is the ideal situation look like? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. So when season two started, um, Yumi Uchiyama, who mm. plays the Rudius in, in the J, had to re-audition for the role. 
for season two. <clears throat> And generally, a dub will follow whatever casting conventions uh, the sub uses. Right. So if they are to keep her on for a third season, then I probably would also stay on. I don't expect that to happen. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not anticipating anything. It's because it's also easier to to assume it won't happen. Right. <laughs> to, assume, <laughs> to assume that it will. So it could be, it could be that I get replaced. I have been prepared, like I've been prepared for this from the get go. Like I knew, I knew the day would come. <laughs> they grow up so fast. Uh, um, um, I mean, yeah, if they, if they keep her on board, I, I will stay. I'll stay for as long as they'll have me, period. I, but I also understand if it's a change they want to make. Um, right. I get it. I am just, I'm also just kind of stunned and grateful that for the first time in my life, strangers do think I sound feminine. <laughs> like, I've been told I sound like a little boy my entire life. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and now, finally, it's like, oh, who's this, who's this middle-aged, this cringe middle-aged lady? And I'm like, you think I sound like a lady? Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> uh but yeah, I don't know. I could Goku this shit. You're right. I would love to Goku this shit. <laughs> um oh, some Spanish speakers are saying, "Eh, pregunta hasta qué libro llegó a leer?" Okay, so they're asking, um, what book have you like or what novel chapter have you read up to? Um um and yeah, I guess what novel chapter are you at at the moment? So I I mentioned early, early, early in in the stream that mm -hmm. I have read through book 12, mm -hmm. but that was last summer. And so okay. I have, as I reread, as I'm working through it, I'm only staying a little bit ahead of where the anime is. So mm -hmm. I have now read through, uh, reread through book 11. And today I'm going to start rereading book 12. Um in advance of the rest of the season. <laughs> e uh this this most recent episode that we that we dubbed uh that will come out next Sunday, a week from today. Let me look. I've got I have this book right here in front of me, so hang on. All right. <laughs> this most recent episode that we that we uh, or, well that I just recorded on is almost 200 pages of book. Like oh. they zoomed to the end of book 11 like they cut out so much in this episode it's a little crazy to me right but now th there's so much cool stuff that we get to spend more time on now you guys i know they skipped a lot but we get to... i know they skipped a lot but they had to you don't want them to skip anything in book 12 come on you don't <laughs> nobody does um <laughs> seven chapters in one episode wow this is why we need one hour episodes yeah 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 oh one of our episodes would be amazing <laughs> now speaking as the person who would have had to be in charge of the fighting god language had they adapted that ah uh, thanks thanks for skipping it gang <laughs> you're like and we're good <laughs> <laughs> Uh, generally, I've really enjoyed the pacing of of Mushoku, but yeah, it is they're starting to really zoom through some stuff. Ooh, okay. So, I, another question came through, and it's asking, "What do you think about the rat and all that happens in that part of the story? Will do to the people? Will do to people that read it or enjoy it?" Um, I think I think uh thirty percent of people who are into the show are gonna drop it. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I think th I, I say thirty percent will drop it. I do know about it. I haven't read up to that, but I am I know what happens. And I would like to say that if you hadn't dropped the show by mm -hmm. that point already, that you're on board for whatever. But the show does change again significantly in a way that just may not be may not do it for some people may not do it for some people sure yeah it adds it adds a new aspect to the show that i can see feeling unsatisfying if you are comfortable with what the show has been up to that point i guess right change is hard y'all change is hard change is hard <laughs> <laughs> 
follow Rudius's uh, path there. Change is hard, guys. Relapse happens. It's okay. We'll be fine. Uh, but they also didn't show... Oh, wow. Okay, P Chad is going wild with you just saying that. And it's in slow mode. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, mods, do you mind taking off slow mode just for a second here? I kind of want to... Want to experience what chat is oh, actually like? crazy. Without a 20 second delay here, please. Rat Thank wave. Hold, yeah, right. You're, oh, she said it, guys. She Rat said, wave is my favorite she genre said it. of music. Rat wave, go ahead, guys. <laughs> and now you're actually seeing it in full effect. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I guess my overall thing is yeah, okay. Yeah. We're, you guys are going back into slow mode. I don't trust you guys anymore. <laughs> Or maybe not. There's one. Going. I saw one message about ADHD in there, and I'm like, appropriately, it went. It zipped right by. Right, appropriately. <laughs> I tell what it said. <laughs> so, okay, and jumping into this, I honestly, yes. I honestly think like all of the questions. By the way, chat, great job, and and all the questions that you've asked. It's very, very interesting. Um, just your journey and what you've done so far, and you know how you've acclimated to all the characters. And for me, it's like whenever we've been on some of the or whenever you've interacted with one of the discussion posts that I'm in, and I'm like, there you go. You're clarifying all the, the <laughs> random hate that comes through. And it's amazing to see how actively you are involved with individuals and uh, reading stuff or just interacting with them in the back and forth. It's, it's awesome to see. So I guess in comes in my next question through that, right, is number one, if you could voice act in any other role, any other opportunity, any other isekai, right, that maybe has already been out for a while, what anime would you, is your like ideal anime that you would love to have been a part of? I want to say Ram from ReZero just because I know that that's my friend Ryan Bartley and I would like to hear what she does with Rudeus. I really, really admire her as an actor. I would feel... That's always that's always like a really hard question to answer because it sounds like you're saying I could have played this better than them. Right. But like <laughs> I love Ryan and I would love to take a crack at a role that she played so brilliantly. Yeah. And then I would also want to hear her do do my stuff. Also do your stuff. <laughs> uh oh wow. Chat she said yeah, exactly. Chat she said Ram, not Ram. Big difference. Did say Ram. Because they're they're over here saying who? Who? Who's Ram? <laughs> um, but through that okay if you're reincarnated instead of Rudy what would you do different from him or would you go about it in the same way am I am I being reincarnated from the same life correct oh my god I guess on a, on a very basic level I'm trying to think of how how willingly and quickly because you would you would be learning the language in a new baby brain at about the same rate or maybe 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 faster if you already do have a grasp on a language. Right. It's a question of how quickly I would motivate myself to read a book on magic. Now, if I didn't have to get teleport incidented, it did, mm -hmm. I would hang out at home and grow magic vegetables for the rest of my life. Like, mm. no doubt. <laughs> I don't need to go on adventures and do monster slayings and things. I don't. I need to, I need to grow carrots that sounded very southern just there. That, it that slipped did sound out. Y'all heard it. Y'all heard it. I'm from, I told y'all I'm from Texas. Um, <laughs> but then I would get teleport incidented because that's what happens. Man, I'd probably just die. Let's be for real. <laughs> I would die. You're like the viruses or bacteria would get me. Like, yeah. I don't think, I do not think I am as intelligent as Rudy is in the same ways. Mm. Mm. He is a he is a better problem solver than I am, I think. Yeah. I, I guess let, let's venture into this. I, I'm gonna I guess I'm gonna do this with you here. <laughs> Might oh, as well gosh. if you're here. And yes, I have a whiteboard. Is it the, the greatest? I don't know. For me it is. <laughs> no, it's perfect. There you go. You get a hold of Oh here. nice. Oh look at this. I know, right? So let's, let's break up the chunks, right? So we have Earthius. Sorry for my handwriting. It's garbage. Uh, <laughs> young Rooney, right? Because now, now you got my mind going. Um, Preteen? I guess teenager now, right? So something that's actually kind of... Uh, it's been amusing to go ahead and see. It's the introduction of the support network along the way. And so... I guess my question for you is like... Clearly, there's there's been a huge difference. There's been a huge change from 
Teen Rudy all the way to Earthius and his support mm -hmm. network growing. For you, seeing that dynamic change, seeing the growth of like literally no one being there for him to him only having those in his immediate environment, right, proximity, to him starting to branch out because of his powers and starting to grow out and be become dead end or, you know, all of this wonderful things that he's a part of to finally him having like a full contrived network of individuals that he can rely on in the university, uh, with Rujard, with so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. How has that journey been for you, psychologically speaking, when you're interpreting the script and when you're voicing them? Wow. It's, it's lovely to see him not become quite so skeptical of other people. Mm, okay. Because what changed for him was not that he suddenly was given a support network that then grew. It's that he allowed them in. Right. That's what the change was. Like, he had his family on Earth. Sure. Um, and they tried, and he kept them out. Mm. And when he made the decision to go, I probably shouldn't do that, and he learns to trust people, it's interesting to see how those lessons are learned. Right. Um, not only or not only how he learns to trust other people, but how he learns to trust other people over himself. Sure. And I think Demon Continent, Dragon Slaying, or whatever, where they got that kid killed mm -hmm. in season one, I think that was a huge moment for Rudius going, you know, not not just, oh my god, I'm not as smart as I think I am, but oh my god. I'm not as smart as I think I am. And also I got somebody killed because of it. Right. <laughs> uh, um, A huge wake up call. <laughs> yes. So. And he, I, I, yeah. And he, he learns after that to let go of this idea that he can game any system. So. Uh, uh, I, because he even, he even describes that moment is like, if we wait until the very last second to swoop in and be, uh, Firefly, big damn heroes, uh, will get the most worship points and right. will win the game. And he has to learn how to treat other people like they're real fucking people. <laughs> like they're people. <laughs> so, uh, I'm gonna, following up on that question, are you ready for this? And I, I knew that we we're going to go. Let's do it. Uh, I, oh, yes, we'll get to that question. Trust me, I have it in, in mind. That's going to be my uh, a big question I'll save towards the end chat. Just remind me. So this next question is, for you, this is uh, our shadow and light selves, right? Uh, very Jungian approach. Uh, yes. Of that. How have you, how do you currently view Rudy's like either shadow or good self versus how do you feel he first started? Like if you could label them in some way, shape or form, what what labels would you put on them? Oh, goodness. I want to think about this for a while. Gosh. <laughs> I'm drawn to creator-destroyer as a dichotomy. Hmm. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to see if anything else jumps out to me quite yeah, as yeah, much. No, no worries, no worries. And it really doesn't. It doesn't. Sure. All right, you ready for the follow-up? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful little aspect in here. What is he, I guess in your opinion, what has he been missing for a good while? Or what is he? what do you feel he needs to focus on out of like all the things in here? We're in the purple block, but I don't want to say self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say respect by others i would like to say respect of himself sure i think he likes himself i think he i think he acknowledges and appreciates what he has what he has accomplished what he's made himself to be right he worked hard he knows he worked hard and i think he's proud of that uh he likes himself i think he loves himself i think this entire show the impetus for the entire show is self-love if he because loving loving doesn't have to be adoring loving is caring right and he looked at you know he looked at his dead ass last <laughs> life and went okay like i bet we could you know i bet we can try a little harder next time right um like why don't we hey why don't we try this again 
But I don't think he respects himself, and I don't think he believes in himself. I think he is constantly afraid that he's getting away with something. And I don't think he uh, is exploring that mm -hmm. because I think he writes it off as, of course he's getting away with something. He's getting away with the fact that he remembers that he's reincarnated. And, but that's not what he's getting away with. Like, he's afraid that he's still tricking people into thinking that he's a better person than he is. And I think that's where a lot of his kind of overly formal tendencies come out. Exactly. Oh. Instances in which he, he makes himself small, tries to, like that, and that's, you know, Soldat says, like, that's why he couldn't stand him. Like, what's your fucking deal? We see through this. Exactly. And and even past that, like, there's something I, I kind of want to go ahead and, and highlight through this is, like, even, even for chat, if you recognize, like, season one, season two, season three, Take a look at the very bottom, right? What happens? A displacement incident. What do they have to fight for? Literally trying to find their way back home to find, like, meet their baseline needs. Second one, right? Or you, you come on through. Can can you make your mic a bit louder? Uh, my mic is as loud as it can go, my friend. I can get it closer, though. Um, the second one is, like, security of body, employment, family, whatnot. What ends up happening? Second one, right? Love and belonging, sexual intimacy issues, issues in relationships, issues in everything. No character is perfect. However, this is what I fear, uh, Maddie, is what happens if he relapses, if he's in purple, and say that like there's something really tragic that comes down, and he's all the way back in red. Does he follow the same mistakes that he's done in the past? That is my fear. <laughs> right. Uh, I And I hope not. Mm. I hope not, because I, I do think I would categorize this as a relapse for him. Right. But I think he is kinder to himself in the long run mm -hmm. about it. And I think that is why there is a, a, a better outcome for him. He doesn't he I mean, he doesn't relapse and die. Like, it's not it's not something there's no coming back from. Like, he's. He's growing. He's growing and learning and figuring it out. I, I don't know. Like, yeah, I just, I trust him. I trust my, I trust my boy. Right. Through that, I, I guess I, I just want to highlight one last thing for them. And it's this, which is, this is the grief wheel, ladies Ooh. and gentlemen. If you haven't seen it, it is what it is. Here's your first little look at it. Uh, a big part of the grief wheel is something happens in your life. Could be a relationship, breakup, friendship, breakup, someone passing away, a loved one, dog, whatever it may be. We all go through these stages in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes we deteriorate. Sometimes we recover. But my main thing is sometimes when we go through it, it's always wonderful to have people there for you. My only fear is sometimes, how do I highlight this? Uh, old tendencies tend to come in and we think what helped fix us previously can fix us again. Mm -hmm. That's just a very standard habit through that. So my question for you that, is... Well, that's, mm -hmm. that is, that's what causes the relapse, I think, mm. is that thought. I don't think that, I think that's why the relapse happens. That's not an effect. That's not a ripple of the relapse, I think. Right. Ooh, I want to talk to you again in like three weeks. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> feel free. I'm always more than happy whenever you have time. <laughs> You're probably gonna see me cry or something if it's if you're going if you're this excited about it. I'm scared. I'm scared. <laughs> it's it's a it's a it's a lot. This is a this oh oh. <laughs> Wait, isn't three weeks I like you, Father's Day? I tell you, I tell you what. Mm -hmm. I will say it like this: If the show moves forward without me and I never get to play Rudius again. I'm glad that this is the arc that I will go out on. No. Like, this is a great, it's a, it's just a really juicy character moment that I, that makes me really proud of my boy. Mm. I love my son. I support my, I support my son. Who right. is also me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, oh my God. Now you have instilled like so much like curiosity and doubt in my mind maddie what have I you done built it up, i built it up a lot i know i built it up a lot but it's like it is it's it's hard to talk about otherwise sure <laughs> well i was gonna say because i'm looking at this in two weeks it's what father's day or something that it is so i'm two three weeks i'm really curious what's gonna end up going through with it but anyway my final question well, i guess big question for you is 
Uh, in terms of just Mochko Tensei in general, if you could destroy Rudius, how would you go about destroying him? Destroy Rudius? Mm -hmm. Oh my god. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I, I almost said a spoiler. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, rat. Yeah, like, I can't, like, <laughs> this is, you have to find the thing that's going, you, you can't destroy him, but you have to find the thing that will. And somebody tries it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but with, with that being said, Maddie, I genuinely appreciate you. Thanks so much for coming on, sharing your experiences, sharing what it's like to be, you know, just so involved with the characters and all the behind the scenes and just, you know, actually delving into a little bit of the psychology behind the characters and how you come into. Absolutely. Being... Thank you so much for having me. This is really exciting and I'm having so much fun. I've been having so much fun. Well, I'm glad. And I hope that like, you know, in the future, whenever you have time or if you'd like to, I'd be more than happy to have you on, uh, especially if when, whenever your schedule frees up, I, that'd be amazing. Um, absolutely with that being said uh anything exciting that you're working on anything you want to shout out to all the people here or anything that you want to say to them before uh we end the interview i guess uh oh my gosh um I, guys thank you for hanging out for this like this is this is really cool like what a what a fantastic community you have here oh thank you um the only thing I have happening right now that I can actually talk about is Mishoku Tensei. Keep watching Mishoku Tensei. I don't care what <laughs> language you watch it in. I don't care if you watch it, read the book. Don't read the manga. I don't right. recommend the manga. <laughs> <laughs> uh, enjoy the thing. Spend more time talking about things you enjoy than things that you don't like. Um, if you are in or near the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I'm doing a convention Ooh. in mesquite called etchy expo Ooh. <laughs> uh the weekend of june 28th i will be let me see i don't remember where this where this town is i have a couple of cons <laughs> i can talk about yes bring them up please is this is this in minnesota hermantown minnesota i'm gonna be oh. in hermantown minnesota in august i'm gonna be some of these aren't announced yet don't tell anybody <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to be in Fargo, North Dakota in September. If if you're near any of those places, come see me. I would love to say hey. Right. Uh, if you want me to come to your con, tell your con to reach out to me. I The voice actors are like vampires in that way. <laughs> but through that, I, I also want to say, if you're ever on my neck of the woods, let me know. You know, I'd be more than happy to go ahead and go out Absolutely. and do, con, do whatever with you. It'd be amazing. With that being said, chat's like, oh, have her, like, you know, have her uh, watch the, because we're going to do a full analysis of whatever the episode is in a little bit. And I'm like, no, <laughs> chat, that would take forever. <laughs> they, already, they already know we take like three, four, five hours literally dissecting everything we can. But honestly, Ooh. Maddie, you're amazing. I appreciate Can I, can I like come dissect the finale with you? That would be amazing. If you'd love to, if you'd like to, I'd be more than honored to have you here for the finale. That sounds like it would be very fun. If if you're down, we'll we'll reach out. I'll send you a message and we can plan it. I like that. I like knowing that there are people who like this show as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Our, oh, do you have chat all hyped up? They're saying yes. Let's go. One hundred percent. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So I get <laughs> if you're here for the finale. I hope you're okay with like deep questions to you while we watch. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh hell yeah. All right, I'm Matt. Always, always. Maddie, you're amazing. We'll keep in touch, especially for the finale as everything's coming along. I adore you. I think you're an amazing individual, amazing actress. Thanks so much for being so vulnerable with us. And know Thank that there's you. genuinely know that there's a community out here that loves you, supports you, and just loves all the work that you do. Thank you so very much. You and and all of your all of your followers, all your watchers. Um, thank you guys so much. This has been really, really lovely. Thank you for thank you for letting me be be open and vulnerable. I I enjoy doing that, and I I like trusting that this is a, a good space to do it in. So thank you guys. Bye everybody. Oh, how was that, guys? I don't think I've seen any other fucking React analysis channel get back into it like this. Actually have Rudius come on and like join us with this, ladies and gentlemen. They'll be joining us for the finale. They'll be looking at their schedule, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you guys enjoyed it. 
Um, we were just talking a little bit before she had to uh, had to take off on the Discord, and she was saying that she recommends our channel a lot to a lot of people for them to further understand Rudius. Let's fucking go. Or just Moshko Tensei in general, which is fucking great. Let me grab a beer real quick to celebrate because that was fucking hype. Dude, Maddie is so incredibly nice. I, I didn't know what, what to expect because we've been messaging back and forth for a good little bit, right? But she is so incredibly nice and just like out there. I hope you guys got that same feel as well. And thank her for being so vulnerable and amazing. Guys, just drop a bunch of Doritos for Maddie for that interview. And for the fact that we actually went through me. She even joked around about the rat. Think about that, guys. That's incredible. You guys are fucking amazing. Let me grab a beer. When I come back, it's right here. We'll get started with the episode.